Let's talk about the second part of the character connection composition. That second part is the story. In the second section, the story section, you will tell a story about your life that demonstrates the character trait in yourself. The character trait was established in the first section, the connection section, when you compared yourself to a character from myth. In this section, you're not talking about the myth character, you are only talking about yourself. Before we go to the model example, let's take a look at the rubric that will be used to grade your composition. The rubric requires you to fulfill a number of tasks. This is the most developed section of the three. Those tasks make sense, considering what we know about literature. First, you must develop a setting, and you must develop that setting with imagery. The imagery should be detailed and should help the reader see and feel what the place is like. Second, you will develop character. Characters should be real. They should have character traits. You can direct, develop those characters through direct or indirect characterization. You can tell the reader directly what they are like, or you can imply what they are like through actions, statements, and other evidence. Third, you will develop conflict. Conflict, of course, drives a story, and without conflict, there is no story. That conflict could be any one of a number of types, personal, internal, social, environmental, but you must develop it clearly according to the definitions in class. You would never state directly the conflict of the story is this. We are storytelling, so you develop the conflict by showing it, not telling about it. Fourth, you will develop dialogue. Dialogue, of course, makes a story entertaining, and we'll see how that can develop through the model example. Fifth, you will develop transition language. Transition language helps people understand the transition of time and place. If you move from one place to another in your story, or if you move from one time to another in your story, transition language will help that along. Next, you will develop all parts of the story clearly. Make sure that there is nothing unclear in the story that all settings are described clearly, characters described clearly, and especially plot events. And that means that you have an initial incident showing conflict, action that develops that conflict, and a climax that finally resolves it. Next, you will use a consistent voice. That voice should be first person for your story. You mix first and third person throughout the entire paper, talking about your myth character in third person. But remember in this section, you are only discussing yourself. So stick with the first person voice. Next, of course, we are talking about paragraph development. And the writer should use paragraphs effectively to separate ideas. We'll see what that means. That's it for the part two rubric. Now let's take a look at the model example. In the first video, we read the first two paragraphs, which were part one, the connection. Let's start with paragraph three. The time was 8.40 a.m. The school day had not yet begun, and I was sitting at the counter in my room, finishing some work before students flooded the halls. Soft light and dreamy music filled my room, soothing me before the rush of students into the bright halls. I was feeling centered and ready for the rush of classes when laughing and yelling blasted into my room, muddling my calm. I looked through the bright doorway, a frown crossing my face. Notice here that I have established the setting. I give the time and the place, and I even give some language, light, soft light and dreamy music, um, the rush of classes, I was feeling centered, the bright halls. These, these are detailed imagery which show exactly what the place is like and how I feel. I was feeling centered and ready for the rush of classes when laughing and yelling blasted into my room, muddling my calm. This is the initial incident. It establishes the conflict. I am about to have a conflict with something outside. And we can see that developing here. I break paragraph and continue. Walking into the hall, I look to my left. Just as I thought, a pack of wild sixth grade boys was massing for the bell, waiting eagerly to run through the halls to be first at the lockers. In a mass of bodies, they pushed and pulled at each other, giggling like monkeys. From fifty feet away, I saw my target, a medium-height boy with brown hair and a large blue and gray backpack. He wore shorts, sneakers, and a t-shirt, the standard junior high uniform. He stood with his back to me, pushing his friends back and forth. I walked down the hall. This continues to develop the conflict, as I have my conflict character. And that means it begins to develop character. Through indirect characterization, a description of how the character is acting, I can start to see a little bit about what he's like. I also get some more description of the setting, describing the hall. So, I have setting description, 
character description, and further development of the conflict. This will be a personal conflict of me against the student. When I reached the boy, he continued to push and laugh, never turning to me. I stood behind him, putting as much menace into my stance as I could. Seeing me, other boys shrank away, but my boy kept on. I tapped him on the shoulder, but nothing changed. I tapped him on the shoulder again. Excuse me, I called calmly. He finally turned and saw me, but no real recognition lit his eyes. He seemed blank, unaware of his danger. I crooked my finger. Come with me. Turning, I started slowly back to my room. The boy followed. I directed him inside. He entered to the dim lights and eerie music. More setting description. More discussion of character. Indirectly developing the boy. Indirectly developing myself as well. Dialogue starts to enter the story. And notice that I've included dialogue in the course of the regular paragraph. When one is developing dialogue, one can choose to separate it from paragraphs or include it in paragraphs with regular description of plot events. I've decided to include it inside here because I feel it is part of the description of events rather than a separate conversation. Notice that I will begin a separate conversation after this paragraph. Of course, this paragraph continues to, in detail, develop the events of the story and the conflict. Let's continue. What's your name? Quietly, Eric. Speak up, please. Eric. Okay, Eric. I'm Mr. Clarkson. Do you know why I asked you to follow me? Eric shrugged his shoulders. Well, you seemed a bit out of control back there. Pushing your friends like that may seem like fun, but you were doing it in the midst of a crowd of wild boys with little concern for consequences. It's a bit dangerous. Do you know what happens when the bell rings? Notice that I'm including dialogue. My dialogue is fairly clear in the speaker, so I don't necessarily need Mr. Clarkson said, Eric said. Doing that every single time will be redundant and will slow down your writing. Rather than doing that, I've decided simply to alternate by breaking the line. What's your name? Press enter. Quietly, Eric. Press enter. Speak up, please. Press enter. It's pretty obvious who's speaking. The line breaks indicates the trade of conversation. I will continue. Do you know what happens when the bell rings? Everyone walks to their lockers. Walks? Well, some people run, I guess. That's it exactly. Some run in a large mass. They grow pretty out of control. In the best of days, I'm concerned that someone will get hurt. When someone is pushing others in the group, I'm almost certain of it. We're here so I could stop you from acting dangerously and risking your friend's safety. Does that make sense? I guess so. I'm here every morning, pretty early. Often, I check the crowd in the halls. From now on, I'll be looking for you, just to make sure you haven't forgotten how to behave. You won't forget, right? No. The dialogue continues to develop the story. And it seems that I have a clear purpose in the story. I want to ensure safety. Eric has a clear purpose, too. He just wants to have fun. This is the personal conflict. The conflict in this story is clear because one can see how the two characters, protagonist and antagonist, have clearly different motivations and goals. I want something that Eric does not want. He wants something that I do not want. And our different motivations and goals bring us into conflict. Further development. Good. And now, my best Severus Snape glare filled my face. Because the next time, I'll discuss the issue with Mrs. Ogren. I'll recommend to her that you report to me every morning as soon as you arrive at school to do work here in the classroom until five minutes before classes start. I have a lot of shelves, and they become pretty dusty. I have a lot of desks, and they become pretty dirty. No doubt, Mrs. Ogren would love to assign you to me for the rest of the year as an extra special helper. Does that sound fun? Not really. I hope not. Let's remember what happened here this morning and hope it does not go any further. Thank you for your time, Eric. You may go to your locker now. This is the end of the conflict. I, of course, have won. I have secured safety. I have stopped Eric from acting in an unsafe manner in the halls, and most likely he will continue to act in, in a safe manner for at least the next few weeks to come. I've indicated that I'll be watching him to ensure that. This means that the conflict between Eric and myself, the personal conflict, where his fun conflicts with my need for safety, has ended. My need for safety has won out, and it's fairly clear in the story that that has happened. So, the conflict is over. It has developed through our discussion, and now it has ended. And we continue. 
Without a word, he turned and walked quickly into the halls his friends had been running through for the past five minutes. 8.55 a.m. Not bad. I drew that one out pretty well. Smiling, I congratulated myself on another job well done. Another student saved from a disastrous mistake. I haven't necessarily said help, or helpfulness, or guidance. Those, of course, relate to the character trait that I'm talking about. However, it's fairly clear through implication that I feel that I am helping Eric continue to be safe. And I refer to that here. Now, in part three, I will specifically refer to it through the reflection. But it's enough here that I just tell the story. From this point to this point, I am merely telling a story. Parts one and three reflect on character traits and literature and the meaning of the story. But here, I am just telling it. And I'm telling it, importantly, by using imagery to develop the setting, by clearly progressing one event to the next, using dialogue to help it along, clearly developing two characters, myself and Eric, and making sure that the conflict is clearly established and resolved through the climax. My voice continues to be first person throughout. Since I've done this, I've answered all the different stages of the rubric. I've developed setting, character, and conflict. I've used dialogue. Transition language is included to help understand the progression of events. I've developed the story clearly and I've kept a consistent voice. My paragraph development has been used to separate ideas, and many of my paragraphs break because of dialogue. Everything is clear, and that is the mastery level. Your story, no doubt, will be quite different from mine. However, despite the superficial differences, we will share these aspects in common, setting development, character development, conflict development, and so on. Make sure that you follow through the rubric, ticking off each criterion, to ensure that you have established it in your story. Write the story, make mistakes, succeed, share, polish, work with me, work with other students, and you can achieve all the levels of mastery as well. Please bring any questions that you might have to class.